Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,981. Be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today, I'm in a very unique place in California, Solvang, very unique town. We're going to learn a little bit about that with a very special guest by the name of Jim Palum. Jim, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have any gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? I'm ready to peel out here, Mark. <laughs> All right. I kind of thought so. Now, before I give you a proper introduction and we dive into your world, tell us one little thing that maybe most people don't know about you, Jim. Well, I... Uh was awaiting this question, and I'm a little bit reluctant to tell the, the truth, but I'm going to do it. This is the first time. So, you know, I grew up in, in New York City and went to school in Brooklyn and lived in Queens, and it was kind of a difficult uh, commute in terms of me being a little guy uh, riding on this, uh, one of the tougher subway lines from Queens to Brooklyn. So I started to go to Times Square instead of going to Brooklyn in my sophomore year. And I was playing hooky, so I was truant. And this was not a good thing to do. <laughs> Don't do this. And uh, back then, Times Square was the CD place that, uh, you know, you know from vintage photos and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about the 1960s. And I went down there so many times that I actually ended up getting a part-time job. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And uh, here's where it gets even crazier. So I got a part-time job at a little museum called the Hubert's Dime Museum, and it was a, a freaking flea show, and it was really a bizarre place. Yeah, <laughs> it was sounds in a like basement. It. <laughs> it actually, when they first started in the 1920s, they occupied this entire building, but uh, over the years, fewer and fewer people, I guess, wanted to see freaks and fleas, and by the 1960s, they, they, I think they closed it in about around 1967 and 69. But anyway, I, I roamed in there, and again, I'm a little guy, so I'm on my own, you know, by today's standards, you know, an unaccompanied young kid, I guess I would have been 15 years old, maybe, in CD Times Square in a freak show. It, you know, it just was a wrong place to be, but there, it was sort of a family atmosphere in there. Uh, of the owners and the people that worked there many for, for many years. And, you know, from bearded ladies to sword swallowers and snake dancers and so oh forth. Oh, my gosh. And <laughs> yeah, so they, they saw me there all the time, and they I guess they took a liking to me. And they said, well, we're going to make you part of this little act here with CeeLo. And CeeLo was a guy with no arms. And uh, he was a, um, not because of an accident, but a birth defect. And my job was to hand him a pack of Lucky's Strike cigarettes. And we would, I would prepare the pack in a special way that he could easily, with his little, little flap, they were kind of flaps for arms. Uh -huh. And he'd be in kind of a, you know, a armless t-shirt. He kind of, he looked a little bit like Popeye. Huh. And he would take the cigarette out with his mouth and kind of moving his shoulders around and then he'd light it. And that was part of my job. And oh my then I would help, you know, hand swords to the sword swallowers and things like that. Yeah. So very few people know I did that. And <laughs> now perhaps the world does. Now, and yeah. it, it, was, it never, never made it to the resume. <laughs> well, that's got to be the most unique answer to that question I have heard. And that's saying something considering how many people I've talked to. But holy cow, that is a wild one. Well, you know, I don't know if we can go anywhere more up from that. So nice talking to you, Jim. It's been great. <laughs> well, we'll talk to you again. Wow, that is... By the way, there there is a book. It's a famous art book, if you can find it. It's called Freaks. And it contains uh, a number number of really amazing images by Diane Arbus. Mm -hmm. And you, you may know that name, uh, particularly if you've been in the graphics business, thought, yeah. is one of the um, real successful, in a sense, street photographers who right. uh, shot oddities for the most part. That was kind of her specialty. So there are a number of the Hubert's uh, Museum photos in there, if anybody's interested. Wow. What a story. Holy cow. Well, 
We'll try to make it even more crazy uh, as we go on here. But I think I think you topped the you topped the uh, answers to that question by far. That is something else I can't even imagine compared <laughs> to my life. Uh, the only hookies I played was to go surfing. So uh, there you go. Yeah, for the kids listening, I did finish high school. At, it was Brooklyn Tech. It was a good school. Uh, it was I was in the industrial design course, and I wanted to design cars. That's uh, kind of how I chose that school a little late in the game realized that I was you know going nowhere fast so I uh, did finish out school did graduate and eventually got into an art school well moral of this story and it's probably politically incorrect to say but don't hang out with freaks and fleas uh, stay in school yeah <laughs> <laughs> there you go but oh my gosh well let me give you a proper introduction here Jim Palum is the executive creative director of Jim Palum and Partners where they create result focused programs and integrated campaigns for a variety of businesses including those in the automotive sector since 1976 after he left that crazy place he was hanging out with as a kid uh, he has worked his philosophy of work hard, play hard has tied his business tagline to hot ideas delivered fast. I love that one too. Ensuring the high level creativity, intelligent strategy, and exceptional solutions that he produces. Services include advertising, marketing, branding, package design, communications programs, and of course, photography. His automotive photography includes his work as a photojournalist, and he's a contributor to the website Car Guy Chronicles. In his spare time, Jim tinkers in his garage with a 73 Porsche 914 2.0 and a beautiful T100 Triumph Bonneville he calls Bonnie. Uh, he also has an Etsy shop titled Well Picked where he shares his vintage treasures. And if that isn't all enough, Jim also is what we would call or he calls a crude songwriter and guitar player. You can actually go and listen to a bunch of his songs, which I enjoyed this morning. Nice job, Jim. We'll be first back in just a minute, but first <laughs> a word from our valued sponsor. So give him a little love. Sit tight. We're in for a fun ride today, no doubt. We'll be right back. Covercraft has the most complete line of custom seat covers available. Choose between the poly cotton seat savers, Endura Precision Fit custom seat covers, Leatherette Precision Fit custom seat covers, and their durable Carhartt seat covers. They're all easy to install and remove. And guess what? They're machine washable too. Easy cleanup to make them look brand new. No more worries about the kids spilling on your seats or your pets damaging your expensive upholstery or leather. Covercraft's quality seat covers protect from damaging pet claws, pet fur, hair, mud, moisture, food, drink spills, drool from permanently damaging your vehicle's fine surfaces. Headrest and armrest covers and color options are also available on many of the styles. And I've got a great offer for you. If you use the code YEAH21, Y-E-A-H-21 at Covercraft.com, they'll give you 10% off plus free shipping. That's right, 10% off and free shipping with the code YEAH21 at checkout. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. Visit Covercraft.com today. Last year, I changed my collector car coverage to American Collectors Insurance. That's who now protects my Porsche Turbo, the one I call my orange crush. But did you know they also insure your valuable collections of automobilia and other collectibles? If you're like me, you've invested in a lot of cool collectibles over the years. Those items are valuable. And if you were to lose them in a theft or a fire, well, try to get your normal homeowner's insurance to pay you what they're worth. Good luck with that. American Collectors Insurance provides you with assurance and confidence that your collectibles are fully covered. They insure a lot of items, including automobilia, wine, baseball cards, books, figurines, die-cast models, model trains, glassware, sports memorabilia, toys, and a whole lot more. American Collectors Insurance, they've been protecting us enthusiasts since 1976. They provide you with an agreed value insurance policy backed by a long history of taking care of their clients. Give them a call today for your personal agreed value quote at 866-ACI. Yeah, yeah. That's 866-224-9324. Tell them you're a friend of mine, Mark Rains here at Cars. Yeah, American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. Automotive enthusiasts just like you and me. That's American Collectors Insurance. So, Jim, uh, 
Let's uh, move ahead from the uh, interesting high school career you had and talk about uh, your business and how you got involved with graphic design, advertising, and of course, photography. When you go to your website, there's also an area there about your car photography, which is really, really cool. It's how I originally found out about you, although you were a follower of mine, so we connected that way, which is pretty cool. So let's start with this background of yours in creativity and your love for for, um cars. And I know that you uh, you ended up graduating from the Parsons School of Design, right? That's correct. Well, take it away. Well, yeah, you know, uh, going, uh, segueing from my challenge times in high school, I did want to study industrial design. And through the encouragement of a friend of mine from high school who found me working in a factory after high school, I literally dragged me out by the collar and said, listen, they're doing an experimental program at Parsons School of Design. And that used to be on East 54th Street back in the day, right up from Sutton Place, a pretty fancy address. And he took me into the school and introduced me to the head of the industrial design department, a gentleman by the name of William Katavalos. And if you want to Google that, anybody who's listening, you'll find out what an incredible creative talent uh, Mr. Katavalos was. He has since passed, but He was an architect and a designer, and he had friends like Buckminster Fuller, Paolo Solari, and they would think on very grand scales. So what I thought was going to be an industrial design program at Parsons, uh, they had actually changed the name under Katavalos' reign uh, to Design Correlations. He had an opinion and so did all the instructors that were kind of disciples of his underneath him, uh, that Anyone can kind of render, which is not true, of course. Uh, the school that would have been 180 to what we were doing would be Art Center in L.A. at the time. And that's where I should have gone because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to come up with great ideas for fabulous cars and particularly fast cars. And um, here I was uh, with William Katavalos in a program called Design Correlations. And what that really was was that we want you to be able to think We want you to think better than everybody else is out there. Um, And that's how we're going to solve um, the design problems, but more more importantly, the problems that the world faced. And again, uh, this was, you know, back in the uh, Earth Day, early Earth Day uh, movements and and programs like that, uh, the whole Earth Catalog. And these were, gosh, at one point or another, we met all these people, including Bucky Fuller. That was quite interesting. And the goal was to, again, think global, think big. So rather than designing a taillight detail on a Camaro, we were designing underwater underwater, undersea uh, worlds. And we were just completely out there uh, conceptually. It was a great idea. However, it didn't prepare you <laughs> with the kind of skills for, that For most like a real job? <laughs> yeah, for a real job in, let's say, the, the industrial design department at General Motors, which is where I thought I would end up, you know, wearing a, a skinny tie and a white shirt at yeah. one point. But this, again, was kind of the hippie days. And so, you know, we all had long hair and we, um, you know, we experimented with this and that. And But there really were some great thinkers. And one of the instructors is a gentleman, uh, his name is John Berenger. And he walked into a classroom one day and uh, this was going to be the first day of the class. And he just was, uh, he looked like he was right off the Sergeant Pepper's album, the Beatles album, of course, which was a big thing back then. And... We all thought he was very cool, and he was cool. And he was a very lauded and awarded designer, industrial designer. He worked, used to work for Lennox Crystal, and I think he was the head of the de- design department there. But here he was at Parsons, and we were just mesmerized by this guy. He was a handsome guy, and he wore the John Lennon glasses, and he kind of had longish hair, and he, but he also had expensive suit jackets. <laughs> I remember that. And we were about a year into the program, and he offered me a job at his company in Manhattan. He was partnered at the time with a fellow, his last name was Jacobson. I'm actually forgetting his first name. So Beringer and Jacobson was a think tank. And while I was still studying at Parsons, I was also working and getting you know school credit at Beringer and Jacobson. And that was my first entree into having a job in the creative field. And somebody paying you a little bit of money, it wasn't much money, but it was a spectacular environment. As a matter of fact, uh, if there's time, Mark, my first day there, um, this was 
off of uh, Lexington Avenue in the 50s. I don't remember the exact address, but I showed up and, you know, took the elevator up to the sixth floor or whatever it was and found the door and opened it up and I didn't see anybody, but I could hear activity. And I, you know, it was kind of a standard office uh, place, New York City office. And then it dawned on me, I just followed the noise and there was a person under the desk, the reception desk. And it was a woman and she was sitting under the desk with her phone and her pad. And I said, well, I have an appointment. You know, I'm going to be working here for Mr. Berenger. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, he's in the back. It turned out everybody in this company, and there were about a dozen people working there, um, they were all under their desks. Under their desks? Under their desks. <laughs> so why was that? <laughs> this, this, well, I guess the rationale was, let's do something that shakes up your day and your daily regimen. Mm. And maybe you'll think differently about things. Ah. And we spent the day under the desk. You know, <laughs> a good part of that was uncomfortable. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> a good part of it was, you know, you wanted to knock your head against the side of the desk. But you did start looking at things, you know, differently. I right. mean, for the most part, just staring at people's knees and you're hearing activity of people coming in the front door and the delivery guys and so forth. So that that's kind of the world that I entered in terms of my beginnings in the creative <laughs> field. Not too different than your world downtown with the, the freaks and fleas, I guess, in a well, way. It, it, there was there was a cosmic spiritual plan at work, I, I think. I guess, yeah. You know, it was moving me in some kind of direction. And so that that was the beginning. And But he really was an influence to me. And it was to, and I'm sure in all the things that I know about you, Mark, you did this yourself. Uh, if you were to succeed in the kinds of businesses you've been in, you really do need to come up with new ideas and fresh ideas. Right. And that's a good part of what, let's say, even automotive design and automotive manufacturing and fabrication and new modes of transportation, you know, fast forward to Tesla way, way back when. And, you know, things that were, oh, that'll never work, uh, were exactly the kinds of things that we wanted to gravitate towards, um, the things that were a little audacious, a little impossible, and see what could happen. And this is nothing new. I think it happens in any think tank at any company. And, um, it just so happens that back in the 60s and 70s when I was beginning, and this would have been the early 70s, there weren't a lot of companies doing that. So I worked with them and then ultimately got out of Parsons and started a little packaging design business with a classmate of mine. Mine, His name is John Block, and he still is a fabulous designer in New York City, still lives in the same rent-controlled apartment on wow. West 78th Street. He'll never give it up. He'll yeah, never no, give it up. Not with that deal. Oh, yeah. Well, let's fast forward because you came out west to Santa Barbara and started back in 76, I believe. I said in your intro, if I get the year right here, that's the year I graduated from high school. But you were a young guy in your late 20s at that time and you started your own graphic design advertising firm and you've done a lot of different things over the course of time. I mentioned uh, in addition to marketing programs and things like that, you, your love for photography, your love for automobiles, of course, and even music. And uh, yeah, so you've delved into a lot of different things. Yeah, you know, it, it is. It's just uh, when I was floating around Manhattan, Bill Graham, who you may remember that name from Fillmore West, had opened up a facility called Fillmore East in lower Manhattan. And I, again, I was kind of this hippie guy just bopping around, you know, trying to find myself and find a direction and a purpose. And back when they opened up the Fillmore East, they were trying to fill the theater. It was actually a fairly large musical venue by most other smaller clubs, Greenwich Village Club standards, let's say where you might go for alternative music back then. So they used to hand out free tickets and you just had to be there at the right time. Yeah. And I knew when in where that was. So I got to see, you know, Led Zeppelin for free and Allman Brothers for free and, wow. you know, all of these spectacular acts for free. Uh, sometimes you'd be up in the nosebleed section, but uh, again, it was free and it was pretty spectacular. And that's where I kind of got into the music thing. And I'll never forget Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin, you know, when he took out this, this bow and he started to play his guitar with it, you know, and that amazing sound. It, it you know, to see that live wow. was something you just don't forget. And it, uh, as as you know, and I think most people can get it, you know, you can look at little newborn babies and they'll sort of bounce to the rhythm of music. Music is in us, you know, it really is in us all. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things I do 
is I offer creative services to a nonprofit called Music Heals, and that is actually run by my cousin, Dr. Christopher Duma, who is a neurosurgeon, and he does a lot of work with Parkinson's patients. This is uh, something that's kind of interesting. So my cousin, who is also a keyboard player, just, you know, as a hobby, he hooked up with another keyboard player. And his name is Mike Garson. And Mike Garson used to be David Bowie's keyboard player. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And yeah, in the early days of all the the super creative stuff. And uh, as a matter of fact, I believe Mike uh, had toured uh, over the last couple of years with a sort of a tribute group for Bowie. So they, I did the, their branding for them, and these are freebies that I do. And I do a number of these you know, nonprofit things. I, I think that's just part of doing business. Of and it's, it's not so much that you know, we're required to do it. You hopefully will find some nonprofit that you have, have a belief in and that um, you know, you'll find the time and the energy to do it if you truly believe in it. And that's from day one, that's been part of just being in the creative industries, as you might know, having been in that yourself and yeah. still are, um, we're often asked to help out. Sure. You know, I think maybe even a little bit more than some other types of businesses. And for the most part, we're all very willing to do that. And um, it is also uh, on the selfish side, I guess, it's often an opportunity to do what you want to do and right. not necessarily what the client <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I understand that really well. You know, it's tremendous. And it's something I've learned having so many guests on the show is that when we're giving back to others is really when we're happiest. And it, it's oh so important. I always encourage all the listeners out there, find some way to give back to somebody and don't expect anything for it. Do it just from the heart. Uh, it makes you feel really, really good. So I'm I'm very interested in, in the uh, the Parkinson's part. I've had family members with that disease and the music. Uh, I'll have to look into that a little bit deeper. Does, does he have a website that people can go yeah, to? Yeah, it's uh, his name is Christopher Duma, and that's D-U-M-A. So if you just Google that name, uh, you'll get to his website, okay. and then there'll be a link. A link there, I'm sure, for uh, Music Heal. I'll put a link to that on uh, Jim's show notes page here on the Car Show website. We're going to take a short break. We come back. I want to talk a little bit about a challenge that you overcame and what the learning lesson was for that. So uh, keep tight. Uh, we'll be back in just a minute. You listeners know I've been into car care my entire life. I am so excited to team up with AutoGeek in 2022. AutoGeek.net has been a leading source of auto detailing products, accessories, and expert knowledge for more than 20 years. What started in 1997 as a mail order catalog company has grown into a multi-website based e-commerce store that they are today. With a large online presence on its own website featuring close to 100 different brands, AutoGeek has grown to be the largest car care retailer in the country. AutoGeek's wholesale program serves accounts in over 30 countries and its retail sector ships worldwide. Go to AutoGeek.net for the best product selection on the internet today and their stellar technical support. AutoGeek.net. It's where I go for all my detailing needs. That's AutoGeek.net. The most important lesson I've learned after interviewing nearly 2,000 people is that we are at our best when we help others. Cars Yeah! is all about inspiring automotive enthusiasts and helping others to be successful. In 2022, my charities of choice are Tech Force Foundation and RPM Foundation. Both are groups of like-minded nonprofits working together to preserve and promote car culture across the country. RPM was created to ensure that the specialized skills needed to care for classic automobiles, boats, and motorcycles continue to be passed down from generation to generation. They do this by supporting training for young people with a passion for restoration and setting them up with mentors who can share their valuable knowledge. Tech Force Foundation is dedicated to solving the technical shortage that threatens the transportation industry today by providing career development resources and increasing awareness and enthusiasm for the tech profession. Learn more about these groups at RPM Foundation and Tech Force Foundation today. So let's talk about this, Jim. You know, one of the important questions I ask people is to talk about a big challenge, big failure, something they came up against. But the most important part of this is what did it teach you so you could come out positive as a great learning lesson on the other side. Can you take us on a little bit of a bumpy ride? (laughs) Well, there have been many. And in business, I guess the one I could tell you guys is, so I, you know, I ended up in California at 27, uh, came out for a job. I was 
talking to you about this, Mark. And when I arrived, uh, it wasn't there. So that's how I started working for myself on my own as a freelance graphic designer. Uh, I always like to write. So, you know, you combine the art direction and the writing and you end up opening an advertising agency. <laughs> <because> yeah. <laughs> you can kind of write ads. So I did that from 76 through about 84. And that was a, a little studio called Palum Design. And I was located downtown Santa Barbara. And I got quite a bit of work once word got out and the word spreads pretty quickly when you're in a small town um, that, oh, there's this guy from New York City that just arrived. And that would have been a buzz in the creative community. And then the next thing you know, some companies are looking you know, to talk to you and see what you can offer. So I got... Uh, I got some mileage out of that, basically. You know, I don't remember the exact song, but it's, you know, the new kid in town. <laughs> so I, I was able to pick up some clients and uh, a few of them that stayed with me for, gosh, 20 years, uh, one being a furniture company. And then I actually threw my connections to my cousin. He's the head of the neurosurgery department, the brain tumor division at Hogue Hospital in uh, Newport Beach. But he was at one point at Good Sam Hospital in Los Angeles. And I got invited down. And next thing you know, I was doing their, their advertising and marketing, not the complete program, because for the most part, by then, I was pretty much a one-man show. I'd have one or two people perhaps working for me at any given time. But in any case, I, through 84, was doing pretty good and got uh, a buddy of mine who uh, used to share this office space that we had, another great designer. He uh, had taken off and went to work for a, a regional advertising agency. Uh, that agency was, was called Barry Advertising, B-A-R-R-E. And they were doing the best creative work here in the central coast of California. And I was uh, always impressed by the kind of work this small little agency did. And again, me being an even smaller little creative group, it was uh, always something to admire. So anyway, John went to work for them as, as their uh, associate creative director. And he at one point wanted to take a vacation. And he said, would you fill in for me? And uh, for a couple of weeks. And I said, sure. Well, John never came back. He took a job. He never came back. Uh, yeah, he well, he came back and he wasn't a bad guy, but he came back and said, listen, I'm going to take my family and we're going to move back east and I'm going to go work for a big advertising oh, agency. Okay. And and he did. I was there still, you know, filling in for him. So they offered me his position, basically, as associate creative director. And, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to give up my freedom, but I'll have a nice paycheck, and we that we and they were actually the hot creative agency uh, again in the Central Coast, which you know for bigger agencies in Los Angeles and San Francisco and Minneapolis and so forth that you know that was nothing, but uh, everything is relative. So I ended up staying there and for for five years, and I brought in my clients and the business side of things. Mark, we talked a little bit earlier about this. That wasn't what I was trained in mm -hmm. and it wasn't my expertise, but you know, you, I guess if there's something to learn is you, you, you know, get on the horse and, and learn to ride it, you know, right. do, do your homework, do the, you can, but at some point you got to get on it. And so that's what I did. And I said, okay, um, I'll do that. But I, I used to take handshakes as, uh, as in a, a binding agreement on a contract, which was a mistake, but there were actually quite a few people in the creative industries uh, and fields back then that did the same thing. That changed a lot after the computer became a part of our tool kit and things started to be exponential and uh, global at that point. You know, so, oh, I can get I can get logos for fifty dollars you know yeah. in indonesia yeah why am i paying five thousand dollars to do this so yep. in any case i'm there the agency which i really loved working for these people and i worked side by side with rich barry who was the copywriter and the owner he and his wife susan owned the agency and as many of these you'll know this as well is that you're in a creative uh, brainstorming session if a good idea comes up it doesn't really matter, you know, whose idea it was, just as long as it's a good idea. And uh, I would often have good copy ideas in addition to knowing what I wanted to do as an art director. So I wrote a lot of headlines and the taglines and the uh, branding platforms for a lot of businesses. And then I ended up, you know, writing the full, complete 
you know, advertising and marketing materials. And Rich was doing the same thing, and he'd go into the deeper uh, end of it. And I'd do, uh, I guess, perhaps even the easier part of it, which was the cell copy, whereas, uh, rather than, you know, all the specifications and the things that had to uh, meet with the lawyer's approval. And next thing I know, they sold the company, um, and that was because of a death in the family. And Rich Barry decided he's done with this business. He just, uh, this loss in his family was, was just overwhelming for him and he needed to take a break and um, went, on, went on to write detective novels. Interesting. And uh, yeah, wrote uh, quite a few of them. If you, you can look him up under, you know, Richard Barry, B-A-R-R-E. And uh, he had a detective series. And, and next thing I know, this agency was being sold to another small agency in Santa Barbara. So, you know, when you're selling it, little agencies, the assets are the people. It's not, you know, you're not selling computers and, yeah. and, you know, copying machines. So I found myself working for an agency that they and I did not uh, see eye to eye on anything, basically. So it was a rough four years. And finally, they went bankrupt. And I had uh, <laughs> sold my 62 Corvette, the one big treat I had made for myself um, over the years and to um, make a down payment on a little townhouse in Santa Barbara because even back then the housing prices were extraordinarily it's high. It's been an expensive little community, that's for sure. Exactly. So there I was with a mortgage, a uh, single guy, and I'm now leaving a company that just went bankrupt and they haven't even paid me what they owed me in the last, you know, let's say, a few months, not not throughout the whole uh, period I was there. But uh, this is the real challenging part that might have some uh, uh, interest to, for your audience. So I'm I'm there and I'm back out on my own after all these years, and I really felt um, let down. And I was wondering how am I going to rebound? And uh, there there was no silver spoon in the family, um, so I just use that old, you know, and this was, I guess, perhaps a New York ethic where, you know, if you go for a job interview, there's 25, 50 people in the line behind you and you better take the job, you know, don't be a prima donna, just take the job and then do the best you can. And so that's what I did is I just got back out on the street. And the good news was that people heard about me being a free agent, if you will, again, and I got kind of lucky. I landed a couple of accounts. One of them was a company called Windsurfing Hawaii and run by a really wonderful guy, Dick Lamb. And he was starting up a new business. I had been doing some of their advertising for uh, the Windsurfing Hawaii products. And if you remember back in the 80s, Windsurfing was quite the thing, and at least here in California. And they made some of the best stuff. And anyway, Dick called me one day and he said, I'd like you to join us on a meeting, you know, come downtown and uh, got a few investors here and we're starting up something new. And I went in and they started to describe this health bar that they, they and a chemist had developed and it was going to be safe for the diabetic market and it tasted really good. And would you be interested in helping us, you know, get this thing launched with some branding and in advertising and so forth? And I said, sure. And they said, we could give you a piece of the action you know, as one of the owners, let's say, you know, but you're going to then work for free until we make some money. And I made the decision not to do that because I had a mortgage to pay. Sure. And they pay me actually fairly. And that company was called Balance Bar. And Balance Bar went on to grow exponentially uh, pretty quickly, very successful. And uh, one of the things we decided early on was these bars are really good. <laughs> they don't taste medicinal in any way. Why are they being limited to the diabetic market? And it then became a you know a consumer product and in all of the stores. And you may still see them. They they sold the company to Kraft Foods for many 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 millions of dollars. And all of these original owners um, were able to buy nice homes and live their life pretty happily to this day. So uh, that's probably one of those bumps in the road that I went from feeling completely desperate to just kind of hanging in there because I had put the effort in earlier on to number one, show up for meetings, to be dressed well, to have the items that I would need in the meeting. If it was to show my work back then, you'd drag along your portfolio. And, um, and it may sound silly, but there would be a lot of people that didn't do that. 
they show up late. Of course. They, they, oh, I forgot, I forgot to bring my portfolio. And uh, so I think that my New York background kind of, you know, where you, you know, you scratched and scraped your way for every little bit of work you get um, paid off in, in that sense. I think so. Yeah, I didn't bring the, you know, this wasn't a cocky New York attitude. It was just a work ethic thing, you know, um, show up, you know, carpet diem, seize the day, do the work, and then do the best you can. That goes back to the, you know, design correlations thing of how are we going to do this a little bit differently? And uh, that was part of the, you know, marketing strategy that I was able to help and offer to the guys at Balance Bar, for instance. So it wasn't strictly my idea to expand that market, but it was just, I think, a reassurance to them that, well, this marketing guy believes in it too, that we can go beyond, you know, that limited diet, that niche market. And it did. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, I've, you know, it's, I've been in business ever since. And then, you know, Palom Design became Jim Palom and Partners. And that was really, that was kind of funny because I was at that time just me in in the attic of my townhouse that I had purchased. I had finished that off as a studio. And but I, I was uh, you may remember a company out of San Francisco called Hal Reine and Partners, and they did some of the most spectacular creative advertising in the late eighties, nineties, and into the two thousands. They still exist and. Uh, Hal Reine was also the voice on, on many well-known commercials back in the day. There's a little proverb, I guess you could call it, that I kind of used at the time and I still do to this day. It's uh, sometimes good things fall apart so better things can fall together. <laughs> and you need to kind of trust that a little bit. And, you, you know, if you're wondering where your rent check is coming, you know, sometimes that's not easy to do. So, you know. Just keep working and hopefully, you know, you've got something to offer. Of course. Absolutely. Hard work always pays off that persistence. I've heard that over and over again. I'm going to be a bit of a car psychologist today. I know you've had some cool cars. We talked about a beautiful Bonneville, a Triumph Bonneville that you've had and uh, that 914, a 2.0, similar to a car that I had, both 73s. Uh, but if I crawled into your skull and asked you, what kind of car would you be if you were manifest as a vehicle? What would Jim be? <laughs> well, you know, I, I was thinking about that and, you know, the knee jerk reaction is, well, I'd be a transformer or I'd be, you know, I don't want to be one thing. I want to be, you know, adaptable. But it, if I could really just be a car, I think I'd like to be a uh, maybe a 55 Mercedes 300 SLR. You may re you know this, I think, uh, Mark, the uh, Willenhout Coupe. They they built two of them, I believe, and they were essentially race cars. You know, it, you know, you think in your head of bow wings, and uh, but this didn't have bow wing doors. This was built to to be a a, a league, a street legal race race car, um, and they were going to race. Mercedes was um, into the fifty six, I believe, racing season, and I I forget the reason, and I'll bet you know it of why Mercedes stepped out of racing. I think it may have been as a result of some really horrific accidents. Oh, yeah, that was horrible. That was the 1955 Le Mans disaster that involved it was an Austin Healey driver and a Jaguar driver, Mike Hawthorne, when the uh, Mercedes-Benz 300 SLR rear-ended one of those guys and launched into the crowd, killed over 80 people. It was horrific yeah. times. Mercedes uh, pulled everything out of racing after that. That coupe you're talking about, I've seen that car at the Mercedes Museum in Stuttgart, and it's yes. it's one of those stunning, stunning renditions and when you when most people look at it, they go wait this looks a lot like the gull wing but it's not what is going on here but yeah specifically for racing it's it's gorgeous yeah it could do back in the day it could do 180 miles an hour it had a a, a three liter in their eight cylinder motor and i again it was a pro they were basically prototype and as you mentioned i i know of the one in the, the museum i've never been to that museum that's another bucket list thing that would be nice to do but it's a great place yeah it is a just a gorgeous car and if anybody just googles it you can go to the mercedes page and i think they they have a, a tremendous this, there's a lot of good photography on that car you know it's tough looking it's sexy as can be it it just embodies so many of the visceral things and emotional and sexy things that, you know, sports cars and fast cars uh, emulate. And it, it it's just all there. I have no idea what it would be like to drive it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, I think I'd like to be that.
Well, you know, it's an interesting choice, but I understand why. That car to me has always reminded me a bit of a, a friend of mine up in Seattle who's got an incredible car collection, John Shirley. And one of his cars won Pebble Beach uh, a couple of years ago, back in 2014. It's a 54 Ferrari 375 MM designed by Scaglietti. And to me, if you look at that Mercedes that we're talking about here and you park it next to the Scaglietti, there's some nuances about both those cars that look very similar. Now, some people are probably raising their eyebrows right now, but put them side by side, pull them up on your screen, and you'll see some similarities, I believe. I always thought that was the way it was, but uh, that's a very nice choice of a car. Is there a, a great book that you've read that you'd like to share with our listeners you think they should crack open and enjoy? Well, I got to tell you, this is another confession, maybe not as shocking as my days at Hubert's Dime Museum <laughs> at Times Square. <laughs> I don't like to read at night all that much. I'm a visual guy. I like to kind of be designing and, you know, or out there with my camera shooting photographs. And so by the time the evening comes along, I have all these great magazines that come come into my home and my office and I'll I'll scan through them and flip through them and maybe read this article or that article. But uh, the, reading the great big novels, I just have to confess, I don't ever remember really being able to do that well. But the one book that maybe impressed me or influenced me, and this is going to be laughable, but it was a book named Hot Rod, and it was by an author, Henry Gregor Felsen. It was written in 1950. Felsen was apparently a pretty prolific writer uh, with a lot of kind of blue-collar experience and knew how to write to uh, the younger audience, the youth market and teenage market. And the book and the story apparently was, was about reckless driving and the consequences of that. However, I think if I recall, the copy I had on it had the words speed, danger, and death on the front cover. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to pick it up, you know, yeah. and, you know, I think I read that in one night, you know, it's just a little paperback at the time. And I remember that kind of got me into um, thinking about cars, and I, I have an older brother, Tom, who's two years older than me, and you know I'm not a teenager anymore, and neither is he. <laughs> yep. But he uh, he was known as Tommy Tuner, uh, where we grew up in Astoria, Queens, New York, and uh, the guys would bring him short blocks and motors and pull up their hot rods, and um, and we we lived in this brick row row house, but there was a beat up little tiny one car garage that you could barely get one car into, and somehow they would push these hot rods in there. And, and I remember they'd all be smoking cigarettes over the engine bay, big long ashes. And I'd be the little kid just going, what are you doing now? You know, but sure. anyway, that book and um, at the same time, seeing my brother in with his buddies with these old, and these would have been like, you know, late forties kind of cars, American cars that they had, you know, turned into hot rods and would, you know, race down at the connecting highway in, in yeah. Queens. That got me kind of into the whole, uh, car thing. And then the other big influence, because I, at that time I was, uh, you know, I was just a young kid, I don't know, 12 years old maybe. And I somehow saw the Ed Big Daddy Roth illustrations, you know, of the oh, yeah. bug eyed monster driving the, the hot rods. And, you know, very California. You probably saw that way before I did. <laughs> Although I think I'm old. Those little things combined, that book, my brother and uh, Ed Roth. I, I was hooked. You know, I wanted to somehow get involved with uh, fast cars and hot rods. You know, that that was kind of Well, if you can yeah. even find a copy of that book, you're probably going to pay anywhere from 75 bucks to 150 bucks because it's long out of print. But uh, as you were chatting, I went online and found a couple of copies. But yeah, they're uh, a little bit pricey if you can find a good copy of it. But uh, probably oh, that's one of those classics for sure. <laughs> <laughs> You've taken us on a fun ride today, Jim. And before I let you go, now you kind of already did this, but I wonder if you could share a success quote or a mantra or some words of inspiration for our listeners? Yeah, again, that, you know, that sometimes good things fall apart so better things can fall together really works for me. My little old mom who had to hold our family together while dad was, you know, not being a good dad and he was a great guy and, and uh, have tons of love and respect for him, but he kind of bailed for a little while, not, not leaving the family, but it left the responsibilities to my mom, who was a nurse. Uh, she went back to uh, doing nursing in New York City. And that actually turned out to be a good thing because she ended up with a nice pension when she retired. But 
she would be the one to kind of uh, discipline us and, and point us in the right direction, hopefully. And uh, there were three kids. It wasn't a big family, but she had a lot to do. And, and when I asked her advice, she would always just say to me, go with the flow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I didn't quite really understand that, you know, from a philosophical, you know, point of view. But I, I think that's part of it. You know, you think about like a little stick in a brook, you know, in a stream and, and how you can watch it. I remember as kids, we used to intentionally just throw in little things and just watch them bounce down, mm-hmm. down the bubbling brook. And, you know, they'd get caught up for a while and sometimes a, a little swirl of water would come in there and bounce it back out and would continue down. And I think that's uh, very much a good you know, metaphor for, for many of our lives is um, go with the flow, you know, bring something to the game, show up on time. And what I'm using now at my age is an if not now, when mm. kind of mantra. Yeah, I'm old enough now that uh, all these things I wanted to do and I didn't do for all, all kinds of reasons I, I'm trying to do. And that's, uh, Mark, how I got into doing the music. COVID, you know, when COVID kicked in, one day I just got on my motorcycle, actually on that Bonneville, the T100, and I'm up here in the San Inez Valley. It's, it's real pretty here and took a drive down to this Vista area that I saw and I got off the bike and I, I was wearing an old black uh, vintage motorcycle jacket, which actually is just my old <laughs> original jacket. It's just, yeah. we're both vintage now. And I went, I got by this fence where I was went to look out and there was, for the first time that I ever saw it in the 10 years that I've been living up here, there was a herd of cattle. And um, I, I was thinking to myself, oh, that's different. I've never seen them there. And I was just standing there, and this cow looked at me and started to approach me. And <laughs> he stopped, and he kind of swung his big head to the left and big head to the right. And two cow formed behind him, and then three cows formed behind those two. They formed a perfect delta shape. Interesting. And I... Yeah, this I actually have a little YouTube video of this. It's called Cow Cow Club Shuffle by Jim Pallum. And I, I took my iPhone out as this was happening. And I remember, uh, and again, this was in, I think it was maybe April of 2020. You know, COVID was in. We were kind of sheltering in. And so these cows came up. And, I, you know, when I looked back at it from a humorous point of view, I thought, Oh, they're just looking at me. I've got a cow skin on my back. And they're probably thinking, hey, there's the guy that killed Billy. Let's get him, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but uh, I think they just thought maybe I was a food source. I don't Whatever it was, I remember, come, you know, getting back on my motorcycle thinking, we're going to be okay. Yeah, interesting. You know, <laughs> those, those cats are out there doing what they've done for, you know, centuries. Yeah. Uh, the birds are still chirping away, you know. That life in that meadow that day was just not at all changed. Yeah. It was beautiful and it was just progressing, you know. <laughs> and so I went back, I wrote that first song and I wrote, um, you know, COVID Bound, How I Met the Cows. And that was, I wrote it and then I said, well, why don't you do something rather than just have these lyrics sitting around like you've got, you know, another hundred of those things somewhere um, and actually try to produce it. And I, uh, found a, a really talented guy up here, Bear Erickson, and he's a younger guy, and he's extremely, extremely uh, good as a guitarist and musician. And uh, not only that, he also had his own recording studio and uh, just, you know, some of the tops kind of gear and stuff that you need to do stuff. And uh, we're, we're going in, as a matter of fact, I told you this, why today we'd have the interview. It would be tomorrow I go in for another three days to do song number eight, Fine. and then right after song number nine so you know as an old guy you know if not now when that's there you kind go. of what i'm doing well great advice for the new year for you listeners out there i'll make sure i put links to jim's show notes page i'll put a link to a soundcloud page so you can hear about his uh cow song and COVID song and all his other songs they're really quite marvelous so jim you've taken us on a very fun trip today a uh, nice way to start the new year the first week here on cars yeah i wish for you the best uh, as time progresses things are going to get better i promise until you and i talk again my friend i'll see you down the road Mark, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much and blessings to you and your family and to everybody listening. Very kind of you. Thank you. Linkage. It's a new quarterly publication and website that covers the automotive market, driving, restoring, 
collecting, and discovering your passion for motor vehicles. Linkage is about experiences, opinions, and values. Linkage is an actual, informed, reasoned opinion based on first-hand experiences. A talented Linkage team covers the automotive world, the people who share your passion and mine, smart, considered, rational, and experienced opinions, ones you can learn from and grow. That includes our passion that drives auctions and the collector car market. So come with me and join us on this journey. And be sure to use the code CARS Yeah when you subscribe, and they'll give you $10 off. Boom! Linkage, geared for the automotive life. Subscribe today at LinkageMag.com. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.